Okay, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Environmental Research 2023, the session of ambient air pollution. The first, we would like to thank the IOP Publishing for organizing such a great virtual conference. You know, this is a great opportunity to learn the recent recent progress in air pollution and health impacts. So today we have five speakers, and the topics covers a series of air pollution and health study from outdoor to the indoor, from particles to the ozone, from the chemical composition to the number of concentrations, and from the field to the lab studies. So I hope you will enjoy this session. Our first speaker is uh, Kan Hai Dong from the Fudan University. The first, I would like to have a brief introduction of Professor Kan. Uh, Professor Kan Hai Dong, uh, Kang Hai Dong, his research in West case mainly focuses on how ambient air pollution and global climate change affect human health. He has published more than 500 peer reviewed uh, articles and had a total citation of more than uh, 50,000. So he received many awards. I just listed some of them. Uh, for example, the Clarivate highly cited research, China Medical Board Distinguished Professor, uh, Professorship Award and the National Science Fund for the Distinguished Young Scholars, and so on. He also serves as, as an associate editor of the Journal of Environmental Health Perspectives. So today, uh, he's going to talk about the air pollution and daily mortality from PAPA to MC studies, uh, which is the public health and air pollution in Asia to the multi-country and multi-city collaborative research network. So welcome. So Professor Khan, now it's your time. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Hai Dong Khan. I am uh, actually, I'm an epidemiologist. I'm from School of Public Health of Fudan University, which is located in Shanghai, China. Today I'm going to talk about a research story I have been working on for almost 20 years. Papa study actually was initiated about 20 years ago. It's over, but nowadays we are still in the middle of multi-country, multi-city study, MCC study. So I'm going to tell you about a research story I have personally experienced for almost a long time. So this is the outline. First, I will introduce some background information about air pollution and health, especially in China or our Asian Pacific region. Then I will tell something, tell you something about the PAPA study, the MCC study. Finally, a very brief summary about the multi-country study uh, in our uh, field. So background. So uh, we take, if we talk about air pollution, actually air pollution has been a long-standing environmental problem globally and in China. Here, the left side is a global picture about PM 2.5. We can see that in many parts of the world, like China, India, African countries, the PM 2.5 concentration are still very high. Are uh, Also very much higher, I mean, compared with the World Health Organization uh, air quality guideline, which is five microgram per cube meter for PM 2.5 annual average. So this left side is a globe picture. The right side is the PM 2.5 concentration in China 10 years ago and nowadays. We can see that actually the air quality in China, especially the PM 2.5 has been decreasingly substantially during the past 10 years. China has making substantial progress in control air quality problems. While in the meantime, although PM2.5 in China decreased a lot, but for another air pollutant, ozone pollutant, the ozone concentration in China during the past 10 years remained stable or even increased slightly during the past 10 years. So there is some kind of comparison in China. For PM2.5, it increased, decreased so much, but for ozone, it's still a major environmental problem in China. So how about the health effects of air pollution? So let's 
take a look at the funding from Global Burden of Disease Study. You can see that left side is the top 10 risk factor for mortality in the world, and the right side is the top 10 risk factor of mortality in China. We can see that in both globally or in China, air pollution remains a major public health challenge. Globally, hypertension, smoking, and dietary risk are the top three risk factor, and air pollution is the number four risk factor. In China, smoking is the number one risk factor, and uh, hypertension, dietary risk are number two and the number three risk factor. Air pollution, very similarly, is the number four risk factor in China. Totally, every year in China, there are like 10 million deaths in China, and uh, air pollution, I mean, air pollution totally accounts for about less than two million deaths in our country. And uh, ambient PM2.5 and ambient ozone cause 1.42 million days in China. And uh, for ozone, it's 90,000 days in China every year. So we can see that air pollution, both indoor and outdoor, remains a major public health in challenge in our country and also in the world. So how about study design? for air pollution and health effects study. Generally, there are two types of epidemiology study design for the health effects study, observational study or experimental intervention study. For observational study, there are two types of study design, short-term exposure study, linking daily air quality with health outcomes, and a long-term exposure study, linking long-term environmental exposure so today we're going to focus on short term experience study. There are so many designs, including series study design, cross-over study design, or different study design by market study. And for intervention study, there are different level of study like radio object intervention study, or individual level study, like human chunk study, or air purification study. For this Going to study, especially a time saver study in one city, one country, one world. For air pollution study, about three, about three years ago, there are a lot of simple air study in Beijing, Shanghai, in Los Angeles, in New York, a lot of study in different cities. And 20 years ago, there are a lot of mouses in one country, and nowadays there are, there are several ongoing mouse studies in one or two continents. First, let's talk a, take a look at a landmark study in the United States. The name is Max, the short name is Max, the name is National Opportunity Botanity Air Pollution Study. In this study, the they must study our field because this is the first multi study in air pollution health research. Uh, the study collects data from 100 large cities in the United States, collect data of daily temperature and daily levels of PM2.5. Study fundings were published on top microbes, including regional medicine, JAMA, and their highlight the importance of heart and ozone pollution in the house risk. This is the first one, mostly study uh, of the of air pollution. Then Europe, there is a there was a reference study, a field study, air pollution or health, Europe approach. This study includes both cities in Europe and several European cities and several in Central East European cities. Find the significant effects of dioxide and particles. But an uh, interesting thing is that for Western European cities, facts of air pollutants, the cost effects were much larger compared with, with uh, the cost effects in Central European cities. So uh, the difference is huge. Then, 
comes a final study, evolution class are combined Europe and North America approach. So study including both cities in North America and uh, in Europe. And uh, here is the farm pin, and you can let's look at the facts of pin pen in Canada, in Europe, and in the United States. We can find the effect of pin pen in Europe and the United States are very similar, but the effect of pin pen in Canada, the effect estimate was much larger compared with the cities in Europe and the United States. This is the result for ozone. For ozone, the effects of ozone are also very pronounced in Europe and in the US. The phenomena were very similar for Europe and the US. If we combine the three regions together, all of it is basically we can find a significant effect of ozone in different structures of ozone. Let's move on to Latin America. See, the ship in Latin America is Palestine. They examine, let's say, examine the facts of Champagne and the effects of on, on total mortality. Also, the effects were not so much, but for most of us, they look at the best find second association between and mortality. Also, in the mortality. Okay, I will move to our studies region, Asian Pacific region. Our study is what we actually put most in air pollution health study in our Asian Pacific region. Part is a shame. It's a shame for public health in air pollution in Asia. The study was initiated. So, in the first way of our study, three in China, one in Thailand. The three Chinese were Shanghai, Wuhan, and Hong Kong. And I personally was the PI for the Papa Shanghai study. Uh, Papa Shanghai study. And the website of our Papa study actually. In fact, the power study was created by the Health Effects Institute in the US in Boston. And uh, the sponsor, the money, the research, research uh, fund is, was made from Asian development. So this picture shows a fund network. I think uh, Papa study was the first one of its kind. Not only a study, but also a research building process for our regions. And many of our investigators are still very, very active in air pollution and health research. So, this is a group picture of our PAPA team, including a lot of countries India guys, Hong Kong guys, Thailand guys, and uh, scientists also from. Uh, from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, and from, from mainland China. So we, Papa team, still, we have, still have a lot of connections even today. So let's take a look at our major research findings. So this is the results for PM10, and uh, this is the result for PM10. And we can find, we can find very similar funding for PM10 across different Chinese cities, for Hong Kong, for Shanghai, and for Wuhan. The effects of PM10, effects estimate, well, are very similar. But for Bangkok, Bangkok had the biggest, but less precise effects estimate than the other three Asian cities. This is the results for another air pollutant, SO2, cipher, cipher dioxide, and uh, also, also for the three Chinese cities, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Wuhan, the effects estimate were very similar. But for Bangkok, it's the effects estimate was larger but less precise com compared with the ch three Chinese cities. 
This is the result for another result for another pollutant, NO2, nitrogen dioxide. And for Hong Kong and Shanghai, the effects estimate are very well, very similar. And uh, but for Wuhan and also for Bangkok, the effects estimate of NO2 were a little bit larger compared with Hong Kong and Shanghai. This is the final funding for uh, for for Papa study. Uh, it's for ozone's health effects, and uh, we find very similar health effects of ozone in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, and in Wuhan. But the effects of ozone in Bangkok, what the effect estimate was a little bit larger compared with the three Chinese cities. Let's take a look at the exposure response curve. And uh, uh, the, basically we can find in different Asian cities, the, the concentration response curve were different. For example, in Shanghai, we seem to find some kind of threshold effects of PM10 in Shanghai. And, uh, but for Hong Kong and for Bangkok and for Wuhan, basically the curve was linear without apparent threshold. We also add the World Health Organization air quality guideline uh, during that time and the China national standard uh, in the curve, we can find even below the air quality standard during that time, there was still very apparent health effects even under the air quality guideline or standard. After PAPA, there are several multi city air pollution health study in China or in Asian Pacific region. CAPS was the first multi city study supported by the China central government on the health effects of air pollution. The CAPS study includes 16 Chinese cities. It includes not only Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, big Chinese cities, but also some kind of middle level, uh, large Chinese cities including Wulumuqi, Shenyang, Ansan, Tangshan, Taiyuan, and Hangzhou, Wuhan, Fuzhou, Guangzhou. And basically, this is a combined exposure response curve of PM10 and mortality. We almost identify a linear without threshold association between PM10 and mortality. So this is a CAP study. Then there was a much, much bigger, bigger uh, China study on health effects of air pollution. In this study includes the effects, the sample size was much larger, including 272 Chinese cities. And uh, uh, the exposure side includes six criteria air pollutants and health outcome or total and cost specific uh, mortality. And uh, Actually, my group uh, was in charge of this big study, and uh, we have uh, several publications uh, from this study. And uh, uh, here, here I just want to show you the national exposure response curve of PM 2.5 and the mortality. We can find some very, very interesting finding. For example, for daily average, 75 microgram per cubic meter is the current China national air quality standard. We can find even below the current air quality standard in China, we can still find a very steep curve, very steep relationship between PM2.5 and the death risk, which suggests that the current air quality standard in China cannot fully protect human health in China. And also another very interesting finding is line is gradually uh, tend to be flat above the, 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 the point, which is suggests that the health benefit would be greater when the air pollutant reduction are the same in the future. So this is a commentary from the journal. Uh, the, the title is, we need to think different about the PM. The daily mortality risk estimate are somehow smaller in Chinese cities compared with in most studies in the Western world. So we need to think about what's the difference between PM in China and PM in Western countries. 
Is there any special things about why the health effects of PM in China were a little bit smaller, somehow smaller compared with the Western wind? What's the reason for that? We need to think about this one. Also, an interesting finding is about the region specific effects of PM 2.5 and mortality. China is so large. In different parts of China, the source might be different, the component might be different. So here I just show you the different part of China, the, if the relationship between PM 2.5 and the mortality. Basically, in east part of China, we find a very significant association, linear relationship between PM 2.5 and mortality. But for other regions of China, the relationship are much more complex. I mean, the effects, the, help, the relationship between PM 2.5 and day risk are much uh, not uh, uh, not apparent near linear. So we need to think about what's the reason for that. So uh, based on the, our region specific findings, so we do we need to consider regional air quality standard. For example, in the United States, in California, the California air quality standard were a little, a little bit strict, stricter. I mean, compared with the U.S. national standard. So do we China, do China needs to consider a province level a local air quality standard in, in, in actually in China, the Hainan province. Hainan has the best air quality in China. They are now uh, in the middle of considering a much, much stricter air quality standard in China. Nowadays in China, the PM 2.5 annual average standard is 35. But in Hainan province, they are proposing a much lower standard, 10 microgram per cubic meter. So after the Mao city study in Chinese cities, there comes some uh, Mao city study in, our, in East Asia. So this is the heater study, health effects of air pollution and the temperature in Asia. And the Professor Ho Kim from Seoul National University was the PI of this heater collaborations. And uh, my team was in charge of providing the, 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 the data from Chinese cities. And uh, in this heater study, uh, it includes seven cities in Korea, seven cities in Japan, and uh, uh, 17 cities in China, mainland, and the three cities in Taiwan. So this is the heater's publication on this issue. So after the Maltese study in, in, in China, in our Asian Pacific region, we moved to the multi city multi-country study. This study is important because this is the first global level study about air quality, temperature, climate, and the health outcomes in the world. This is our website. Actually, the MCC study was initially was, was initiated to examine health effects of climate. And, uh, uh, and now MCC includes both, including both exposure, not only temperature and uh, other climate related variables, but also air pollution. So this is the air pollution sub project, MCC air pollution sub project. It includes six continents, 24 countries, and uh, 60, 60, 652 global cities. And uh, actually we spend a very, very long time to collect data uh, outside of, I mean, in many parts of the world. For example, in Africa, we spend a very, very long time to collect qualified exposure and health data, but finally we only find good data in South Africa. And in Asia, we collected data from China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand. In Europe, the data was, was very good. It includes a lot of uh, countries, including the Czech Republic, Estonia, Finland, France, Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, UK. In North America, it includes Canada, Mexico, and the US. In South America, it includes uh, Brazil, Chile, and Colombia. In, uh, we also collected data from Australia. So this is the data we collected, exposure side, 
includes PM10, PM2.5, ozone, and O2, SO2, and CO. For the health outcome, we collected mortality of total mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and respiratory mortality. So this is the, uh, is the finished outcomes. But nowadays, we are still in the middle of collecting additional health outcome. We are going to expanding our fundings, our, our health outcome connection to preterm births, to mobility, in, such as hospital admission and outpatient visit. And we are also in the middle of collecting the, collecting, uh, collecting some kind of suicide and other health outcome. So this is the MCC studies statistic methods. Basically, it's a, this is a very classical statistic approach. I mean, to link air, air quality with health outcomes. And we use two pollutant model to test the robustness of the association. And we also uh, uh, examine the exposure response relationship curves and uh, if examine the potential effect modifiers. So how about the research funding? This is our major uh, results for PM10 and PM2.5. And uh, basically, uh, if we pull the, the, a lot of countries together, we find very significant fundings for PM2.5 and uh, PM10. And uh, let's take a look about the health effects of PM2.5 in China and uh, in the United States, also in Japan. In Japan, Here we can very, very interesting funding. For example, for 10 microgram per cubic meter increase of PM2.5, the effect estimated for daily mortality, the increase was 0.4. But in the US, the effects estimate of PM2.5 in the US were much larger, about four times higher compared with PM2.5 in China. And uh, let's take a look at Japan's PM2.5. The effect estimate were very similar with the US, still much higher compared with PM2.5 in China. So this is a very interesting finding. We find a lot of variability for PM2.5 health effects across different countries. So this is the results for the sensitivity analysis. Uh, this is the results for different lag structure. And uh, basically we find a significant association for any structure uh, we examined. And uh, this is the robust sensitivity analysis for single protein model and a multi protein model. Basically, we find uh, significant fun our findings were very, very robust. I mean, in different uh, uh, statistic models. This is the sensitivity analysis for an adjustment for temperature. Also, our findings are very robust. And uh, we also examine the effects estimate stratified by region. So this is the WHO's definition about the region, Asian Pacific region, European region, and American regions. And uh, basically we find in China, in, in, uh, in West Pacific region, the effect estimate of PM2.5, I mean, a little bit lower compared with particles in Europe and particles in America. And if we stratify the region across, according to the GDP level, we still find in the poor countries, in a poor, rel relative poor countries like China or in African countries, the effects estimate of PM2.5, I mean, were a little bit lower compared with the rich country, compared with the Western countries. This is the exposure response curve about PM10, about PM2.5. Let's take a look at PM2.5. And uh, this curve combined for each cities, we actually uh, we actually plotted an exposure response curve. Then we combine the the curves in more than six hundred cities together and plot this global level PM two point five response curve. And uh, this is the WHO air quality guideline and the U.S. national air quality standard and the interim interim target of WHO and China's air quality standard is here. Basically, for any, for any air quality standard, for both WHO air quality standard and China's air quality standard, we can find 
all these standards cannot fully protect human health. And even with the very, very strict WHO air quality guideline for, for, for daily average towards 25 microgram per cubic meter, we find very significant findings for the health effects of PM2.5, even below the, the current air quality guideline of WHO. So I think these multi countries have, have a lot of policy implication because our data is from are not only from a one single country, uh, actually from many regions of the world. So far, it provides the strongest evidence to date about health effects of PM2.5. And this funding suggests that current WHO air quality guideline cannot fully protect human health. We need to change. So, the, so that's why in the year, two years ago, in the year 2021, the WHO revised its air quality standard uh, for PM2.5, the daily average, was the, the, stand, the guideline was 25 before, and nowadays it has changed to 15 microgram per cubic meter. So our global research funding provide some kind of solid evidence for the for the establishment of the latest WHO global air quality guidelines, I think. This is the research funding for, for particles, but uh, there are a lot of past and ongoing projects for MCC study. For example, for ozone pollution, we published our paper on BMG three years ago, for MO2 uh, two years ago, and uh, for carbon monoxide, it was published uh, two years ago. And in just in today, we published a paper about the interaction between PM2.5 and ozone. And uh, we find some kind of addictive effects of PM2.5 and ozone. A combined exposure of particle and ozone will increase the, independent, the separate health effects of these two air pollutants. So let's uh, take a look about the health effects of PM2.5. This is the result for PM2.5. And uh, this is the result for NO2 in this global study. Uh, a, a comparison is that for PM2.5, we find a lot of variability of particles health effects for different countries. The research findings, the research findings are, are, are vary a lot in different countries. But for NO2, the effect size are very similar. I mean, much, much similar, I mean, across different countries. So what's the reason for that? The reason is for NO2, NO2 is similar in every country, it's the same. In every country, NO2 is NO2. It's, it's one nitrogen atom and the two, uh, 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 one nitrogen atom. It's the, the same in every country, but for PM2.5, it's totally a mixture. It has different chemical components. So the different countries, different sources, different components may determine the health effects of particle. So in the last year, we published a paper, we're trying to link the components of PM2.5 with the health outcome of PM2.5. We're trying to examine which kind of components can account for the health effects of PM2.5. And uh, actually, the research found, for example, in this study, we find ammonia. Ammonia might account for a substantial part of the health effects of particle. But for sulfate, for black carbon, for uh, organic carbon or sea salt, the effects were not so large. I mean, compare with compare compare with now, uh, ammonia. So uh, several years ago, after we published our paper on New England Journal of Medicine, Professor Li Xiangdong in Hong Kong and, uh, uh, and published a, a commentary on nature. The title is, Air Pollution is a Global Problem, but the fix of air pollution needs local specific strategy because, because, uh, because air pollution in different countries have different sources. The, the, the component are totally different across different countries. 
the health impact were different. We need to consider, we need to think more to link component, link sources with the health outcomes. So finally, a very brief summary of my uh, this research story. So I think multi-country studies provide robust evidence on the association of air pollution with increased health risk, including total and cost-basic mortality. In addition, there are a lot of study about not only mortality, but also morbidity or preterm birth or other health outcome. So far, I think the epidemiology evidence on air pollution and the health are very, very, uh, the evidence are so far are very robust. So, but in the future, we have more things to do. In the future, we need to link particle component, particle sources with a health outcome. We need more air pollution long-term exposure cohort study uh, in the world, especially in our developing countries. There are so far, there are very, very few long-term cohort study about air pollution in China or in other developing countries. Also, we need more accountability study or intervention study. And also, we need to think about the health effects of in the air pollution and its interaction with climate. We also need more health outcome, including hospital admission, preterm birth, suicide, or other, uh, other diseases. Finally, I would like to uh, our sponsor, Health, Health Effects Institute in the US, our MCC team and uh, our my colleague in uh, Fudan University. Thank you. Very, thank, uh, uh, I appreciate their assistance in 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 doing this research. Thank you very much. My talk is here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Professor Khan. It's, it's a it's a great talk. So, do we have uh, any question from the audience? Okay. Probably I will ask the first one. So, uh, Professor Khan. So. Uh, uh, give a very nice overview of the air pollution studies in Asia and uh, under the world. So you can see the air pollution studies grew rapidly during the last decade. You know, in the Asia, just from the four cities to the more than 16 and even more than 200 cities. So that's a great success in the air pollution studies. So the first question is, so what are the reasons for the variability health effects of particular matter in different countries. So I saw from the PPT slide, the PM2.5 and the SO2 in a bank uh, have much higher health risk than other cities in China. So what's the reason for this? Yeah, actually, thank you very, very much, Professor Sun, for your, for your question. Actually, we talk a lot about the, the different research funding in Thailand and in China. So we assume the different source of particle may account for the uh, variability of our funding. For example, if you go to Bangkok, you can find the major source of particle in Bangkok is from traffic. There are a lot of cars in Bangkok, but in China, still, even in these days, the major source of particle is still from coal combustion. Of course, traffic is important in China, but I mean, the particle source from traffic is much more, I mean, compare with particle from China. So I think different source may have different toxicity, then may have different health impact in the population level. So I think in the future, we need to link different source with our, uh, with our health outcomes. Yeah, that's a, actually another question we are interested in about, you know, which which one is the most important for the health risk? The total PM two point five mass or the chemical composition? You already mentioned the sources. So what do you think? The composition is more important, or the total mass is important? Sorry, Professor Sun, I cannot hear you very closely. It seems your internet is not so good. Sorry, uh, sorry. I mean, I mean, which one is more important? I mean, the chemical composition is more important or the total mass, PM 2.5 mass is more, more yes. important for the health study. Which one yes. do you think is more important? <laughs> okay, so actually the, uh, in, in the community, I mean, in the air pollution health community, we have a lot of discussion on this issue, which component is more important than others. Uh, a lot of scientists working on this area for a long time. Uh, one example is the Health Effects Institute actually initiated a study uh, 
uh, about two years ago, they invest a big money on this issue to look at, to try to identify which component is important than others. Finally, the, the, the answer is, so far, we do not have a correct answer for it. We did not find the answer. Which one is the best one to represent the, the total health effects of PM2.5 mass? Some people may think black carbon is more important. Some people may think heavy metal might be very important, but it's, so far there are no clear answer for okay. this question. I think uh, PM2.5 is a mixture. We need to develop, uh, we need to develop a new strategy, new approach to examine this kind of mixture problem. Okay, thanks, Professor Khan. Uh, we look forward to your new results about the chemical composition and the impacts on the, the health, uh, the, the, the human health. Thank you. Thank we shall you. move on Thank to you. the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Hua Jian Kim. Uh, I will give her, her brief introduction. Hua Jian Kim is an assistant professor at Seoul National University. Actually, Professor Khan just uh, mentioned that the evolution studied in the, also in the Seoul National University. Uh, Hua Jin, she received her PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles in 2012, and then she did her postdoc in the University of California, Davis. Uh, her research mainly focused on the formation and the evolution of atmospheric aerosol particles using both laboratory experiments and field measurements. Actually, she did an excellent work in the characterization of aerosol composition source information mechanism in Korea using the aerosol mass spectrometry and the chamber facilities. So today she will give a talk about this in the comparisons of the chemical and cell oxidant, oxidant production induced by the carbonaceous aerosol. So welcome. Hoji, it's your time. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. So you can hear me, right? Yeah, I can I can hear it. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And it's my I'm Hwajin Kim from Seoul National University in Seoul, Korea. And it's a great it's my great pleasure to give a talk at this special events of environmental research. Uh, as Professor Allison introduced, my talk will be about the comparisons of chemical and cellular oxygen production induced by carbonaceous aerosols. Uh, this is the brief outline of my talk. So first, I'm going to uh, introduce the background of my, talk, my, my research, and then I'm going to introduce some approaches that we apply, and then I'm going to show the results, and I will summarize the results. Um, I think previous uh, speaker already mentioned about the importance of the particular matter to the human health, and we already know that the PM is very important for the health effect. In 2013, WHO already reports that particular matter in the atmosphere is a first-class cancer substance, specifically for the lung cancer. And that research was derived from the many cohort studies with the linking with the uh, long-term uh, measurements of the particular matter in the atmosphere. We also know that particular matter in the atmosphere is related with the uh, death rate. Um, in global study, air pollution contribute to the 7.6% uh, of the all deaths. And among many types of air pollution, uh, 2.9 million people died as a result of the ambient uh, particular matter. And particular matter concentration is all over the world, but you know that the uh, highest mass concentration is observed at uh, Western Pacific region and Southeast Asia, so that those, rate, uh, those areas shows the highest death rate. A major cause of death from those areas is from the uh, heart disease and stroke and cancer. So we already know that particular matter has a strong impact on the human health, but we're still not sure which chemicals and sources of the particular matter are the most important factors for the human health. Um, there are two approaches to investigate for. First approach is the epidemiological approach, and then the second approach is the toxicological approach. Well, epidemiological approach is the one that WHO did it before, and it's based on the statistics and the model. And although it's, we, uh, this approach is the indirect approach and there are some limits, and it's a good starting point to estimate the overall impacts of these certain materials to the health effect. 
However, on the other hand, a uh, toxicological approach is a direct exposure of the particular matter to this cell or mimic of the cell. For example, once particular matter exposed to the human body or inside of the human to the cell, there are many interactions for generation of the reactive oxygen species. There are many different pathways. And continuous exposure of this kind of ROS, reactive oxygen species, can give a stress to the cell and eventually that cause the death of the cell. So the toxicological approach quantifies the amount of the reactive oxygen species gener generating from the interactions of the particles and the fluid along the liquid of the cell. Um, but at the beginning, many studies have been done from the epidemiological approach because that's a good starting point. So many studies shows that in California study shows that OCEC was the most important matter for the mortality. And then the other study also shows that OM and EC is important for the emergency visit of the hospital. And then the other work also shows that EC and potassium is important for the mortality, which is from the global study using the meta-analysis. And potassium is also kind of from the biomass burning. So this provides some evidence that biomass burning is important matter for the health effect. And one study shows that instead of uh, applying the chemical composition or particular matter mass concentration, they drive the uh, sources of the organics and then applying those organics to see the health effect. And they found that mobile and biomass and local combustion was the most significant matter for the emergency visit of the hospital. And the following work from New York shows that traffic and still related sources were the important matter for the health effect. So all those studies shows that organic and elementary carbon, which are called like carbonaceous aerosols, are important matter for the health effect. And specifically for sources, mobile and biomass burning are the most important matter for the health effect. But the problem is that organic carbon, carbonaceous material are the most dominant compounds in particular matter in terms of in soil, which we measured before, and also in global point of view, organic carbonaceous materials are the most dominant. That means it's a very complex mixture from many diverse sources and many different compounds. For example, uh, carbonaceous material like organic compounds are directly emitted from the sources. Also, that can be formed by chemical reactions in the atmosphere. Also, it can be from the anthropogenic, also it can be from the biogenic. And also, uh, it can be formed many different uh, reaction pathways to form the secondary organic aerosols in the atmosphere. So all these variabilities can be a matter of fact for the health effect or toxicity of the particular matter. One of our study, which was performed in Seoul metropolitan area using the high-resolution high top uh, uh, aerosol mass spectrometry, shows that in terms of the chemical compositions, black carbon is most uh, shows the most meaningful results related with the cardiovascular disease. But in this in this case, uh, organic does not show the meaningful results for the uh, health effect. However, when we apply the sources of organics such as biomass burning, cooking, and vehicle, and two of the secondary organic organic aerosol, we, we found that vehicle emission and highly oxidized organic aerosol show some all-cause effects from the particular matter. So our study also shows that vehicle emissions and oxidized organic aerosol has some health effect. Vehicle emission effect is already known for, but we also report that oxidized organic aerosol in the atmosphere also can be a better effect for the toxicity. One of recent study performed by Georgia Tech from the Sally Inks group shows that from the ambient aerosols, MOOA has shows the highest uh, generation of uh, hydroxyl radical, which was performed by the toxicological approach, not the epidemiological approach. So toxicological approach also shows that like MOOA, highly oxidized secondary organic aerosol in the atmosphere shows the high amount of the hydroxyl radical. And several chamber experiments also shows that Secondary organic aerosol can generate the uh, high amount of the ROS, which means that highly oxidized compounds in the atmosphere can have a possibility to have a toxic effects to the human health. However, when those samples to expose the cell, as you can see here, very high amount of those are required, and also it requires a long-term exposure. So in order to see the cell death from the secondary organic aerosols, uh, the escalation of oxidation stress are required. So that means there can be a gap among different assays. Actually, there are many different types of assays to estimate the and quantify the reactive oxygen species uh, 
generated from the interactions from the particular matter in the uh, fluid inside of our body. As you can see on the left hand side of the figures, once particular matter exposed to the our body, there's an interaction and they generate oxygen species. And the, all the all different assays, the principles are the same, like measurement of the amount of the uh, reactive oxygen species are the way to measure the toxicity of the particular matter. But the way to measure the oxygen species are a little bit different. In chemical assay, uh, there are antioxidant depletion or fluorescence formation or ESR method are commonly used. And in cellular assay, MTT and LDH assay are commonly used. So it is important to choose which assay needs to be used, and it is important to check if uh, those assays are uh, providing the consistent results or not. So in this study, we choose three different assays, uh, fluorescence formation assay, and MTT and LDH assay to estimate the uh, toxicity of the particular matter. So here is the brief summary of our assay that we use uh, in, from the chemical assay. So we have a particular matter and we expose that samples to the surrogate lung fluid, which is the mimic of the lung. And then we expose our samples to this liquid. And then there is a formation of hydroxyl radical. And that hydroxyl radical react with the probe to make some fluorescence compounds. And in that way, we can estimate the amount of hydroxyl radical generated from the exposure of the particular matter inside of our body. Also, we can expose those samples to the uh, a lung cell, like we use the human bronchial epithelial cell to expose our samples, and we use two different assay, MTT and LDH. MTT only react with the viable cell, so that kind of provides some how much of cell is viable, viable after the exposure of those samples. And LDH release uh, from the damaged cell, so that provides some how much of cell has been died after the exposure of the particular matter. So with this assay, we check the uh, toxicity of our particular matter. And also we prepare some different types of carbonaceous materials. Uh, from the chamber experiments, we generate the secondary organic aerosol under controlled condition. Specifically in our study, we control the photochemical aging because in previous ambient study, oxidized organic aerosol is, has some significant impacts on the health effect. Also, we generate the carbonaceous material from the combustion processes because combustion processes can generate the EC as well as OC. So we can see some of those effects. At also, we can control the burning condition and some types of fuel as well. So let's have a look at the results and experiments that we did from the chamber experiments. So this is a schematic of our chamber experiments. So we inject our precursor and using the flow reactor, we generate the particles because we can generate the pretty much enough amount of the particular matter. And then we collect those samples to expose to those samples to cell. But before we use the ozone denuder to denude the ozone, uh, to prevent the further oxidation. Also using the uh, high stuff AMS or ESI mass spectrometry, we measure their uh, chemical compositions to link together with their toxicity with the chemical compositions. And then we use three different types of precursors to generate the secondary organic aerosols. Our first one is the toluene, which is representative uh, anthropogenic precursors. And then we also use alpha pinene, which is a biogenic representative compounds. And also we, found, we use the siloxane, which is from both representing indoor and outdoor. And they are also from the uh, old personal care products, such as perfume, lens, and shampoo, et cetera. And their life, lifetime is pretty long. So although it's generally from the urban area, it is also detected from the uh, background area as well. So choosing these three precursors representing different environment, we can estimate their toxicity at different conditions. Also, we can um, have uh, some comparisons structure effect as well. So first one is the results from the alpha pioneer experiments, alpha pioneer SOA. A left hand side figure shows the SOA mass yield versus photochemical age. And then as you can see here at the beginning of the experiment, at the beginning of the age, uh, the par particular matter concentration increased, but after a while it decreased because of the fragmentations. 
Anyway, among our samples, we select four different types of particles, and then we had a look at their toxicity by looking at the hydroxyl radical concentration generated after exposed to the uh, lung fluid. Right-hand side figure shows the OH radical generation. X-axis shows the time. Since we expose our samples to the lung fluid, and then there is a no decay because there is a no consumption of the hydrogen radical. So there is a continuous increase of hydrogen radical for 24 hours. But as you can see, their increasing rate is a little bit different depending on the particles. So for example, while their samples are highly oxidized with a longer photochemical age, their amount of the hydrogen radical is higher. So longer aging results higher hydrogen radical generation, which is consistent with the ambient results. Also, we had a look at the toluene SOA. In case of toluene, we also track the uh, oxidation state. So left-hand side figure shows that while particles are aged more and more, their O2 C ratio increase by the oxidation processes. And for oxidized samples, their hydrogen radical uh, generation was higher than the less oxidized samples, which is consistent that we observe from the ARPA pioneer cases. However, in case of the siloxane, uh, which we use for representing for the indoor and outdoor, uh, overall trend of the hydrogen radical generations were similar, but their trends were, uh, trends were opposite with the alpha pinene and beta pinene. While they are exposed to the samples to the lung fluid, their hydrogen radical concentration increased for 24 hours, but highest concentration of hydrogen radical were observed for the fresh generally particles, which is opposite from the alpha and Toluene. So we, we were trying to look for what's the reason for this by looking at their formation mechanisms. And right hand side figure shows the uh, how the condensable products are generated from our experiments. And we found that there are major two pathways to generate the condensable products. And first one is to make the SOSA3, which is the replacement by the methyl group with the uh, CH2OH. And the other pathway is to generate the SOSA2, which, uh, replay, which, uh, which, is, which is formed by the replacement of the methyl group with the OH group, OH functional groups. And as you can see on the most right-hand side figure, which is from the uh, um, ESMS spectrometry, uh, while they are aged further and more, Water and more and more, SOSA2 is more dominant. So by, by looking at our structure, maybe SOSA3 from CH2OH, releasing of hydrogen hydro radical much easier than SOSA2. So that could cause the uh, high amount of hydrogen radical from the uh, fresh, freshly generated particles. Further study needed for investigating how and why uh, hydrogen radical is easily occurred from, from the SOSA3. But our study shows that structure also important matter for the generation of hydrogen radical, which is also consistent with one of our uh, one of the previous studies. But the more interesting thing is that anyway, for those three samples, hypopinene and toluene and siloxane, there is an observation of the hydrogen radical. But none of the samples shows the death of the cell. Bottom of the figure, which is from the MTT assay, shows that even, at, even for the fresh and aged particle, and even for the low dose and high dose, none of the sample kill the cell. That means maybe the major pathways to kill the cell is not the hydrogen radical, or maybe more amount of hydrogen radical might be needed to reach to the death of the cell. So maybe the capacity to the hydrogen radical formation or capacity to kill the cell might be have some different scope. So that might need some further investigations. And then we move on to the combustion processes. So we generate the uh, carbonaceous material from the combustion process using three different types of fuel and under different combustion conditions. We use wood and coal and burn coal oil. And then we gen we uh, combustion those fuels under different temperatures. By, combust by burning at lower temperature, we were expecting to have some amorphous uh, nanostructure by the condensation of pH coagulations. And by burning at higher temperature, we were expecting to have a fractal suit uh, by the Hakka processes. So as we expected, we was able to get some different types of samples so as you can see, uh, two of samples have burn burned at lower temperature generate the brown carbon, and then rest of other samples generate the black carbons. So using those samples, we uh, tried to look for the how much of hydrogen radical was generated. And left-hand side figure shows the um, comparisons of the hydrogen radical from those different samples. 
And interestingly, those two brown carbon, which was burned at lower temperature, shows a high concentration of hydroxyl radical at the beginning, and they both show the decay rate, which is consistent with the, uh, some other studies. Uh, it is well known that brown carbon has a high potential for the hydroxyl radical, which is observed in our study. And also other studies shows that brown carbon chromophores can react with hydroxyl radical. So that may kind of a decay of the hydroxyl radical occurred in our study. Uh, the hydroxyl radical concentration that I'm showing here is the mass normalized. So maybe we were wondering why coal combustion generate higher amount of hydroxyl radical than wood combustion. So we had a look at the chemical composition of those two samples. And we found that for the uh, coal combustion generated particles, there are more amount of the uh, high molecular weight of the PAH, such as uh, indenopyrene and benzoproline. And those two compounds are uh, the major compounds uh, which shows the best correlation with the OP uh, from of OP generation in previous study. But other than those two compounds, other high molecular weight of pH also higher for the coal combustion. So those are all matters to generation of hydro hydroxyl radical in, uh, in our observations. But interesting thing is that we do the same thing as the SOA. So we exposure those, expose those samples to cell like uh, LDH and then MTT assay. And as you can see here, uh, among our samples for the hydroxyl radical concentration, uh, bunker fuel oil has the lowest amount of generation of hydroxyl radical. But only that sample shows the cell death when we expose those samples to the cell directly. So different mechanisms are going on for the generation of hydroxyl radical and for the uh, death of the cell. So we tried to look for why the cell death occurs for the one call oil fuel and by looking at the chemical compositions. And we found that for death samples, there are a high fraction of uh, low, uh, low, uh, low arcane. And also we found that for death samples, there is a high amount of the uh, metal compounds like uh, nickel and chrome and zinc. We are not sure about the zinc, but nickel and zinc, nickel and chrome is already known for the harmful metal compounds. So the EPA also used those two samples as a risk assessment. So we can see that uh, those two metal is related with the cell death, but we can also see that those two metal is not related with the hydroxyl radical formations that we observe for, from the uh, lung fluid exposures. Um, so uh, from this study and previous SOA study, both shows that cell, uh, cellular assay and chemical assay provide some different results. So it's just, this is my summary. So chemical and cellular assay measure different aspects of oxidative uh, activity from both SOA and combustion generated organic aerosol. So maybe this probably suggests that direct correlation is not necessarily be expected. Separate study also suggests this kind of results. So we need to compromise or we need to set up some re reference to compare the different assay each other at the same table. Um, for SOA, for the hydroxyl radical formations, as I showed you before, like structure and maybe photochemical age amount is the important matters to control the amount of the hydroxyl radical. And also in terms of the combustion generated particles, like how much of uh, the high molecular weight of the pH also matter to generate the hydroxyl radical. But for the cell death, metal compounds do an important role, such as nickel and chrome. Also, we observe zinc, but zinc, there's not much information about the health effect. And also, like low molecular weight of alkane is important matters to uh, generate the uh, cell uh, to cause the cell death. But further investigations might be needed how those low molecular weight alkane can reach to the cell death or some uh, mechanisms. So this is the future study. So we only measure the hydroxyl radical. So maybe we need to investigate other oxygen as well because all hydroxyl radical formation is not linked directly with the cell death. And also we need to try to uh, test some other precursors with different structure because combustion studies shows that arcane is important and some other structure like the conjugated compounds are important matter for the health effect. Uh, so also maybe I didn't write here, we need to investigate like the comparison study uh, among some different assays. Uh, this work has been done with a group of people in our group because making 
a survey and collecting samples and combustion is all different and difficult matter. So we all collaborate together and two students in the circle do the major work for the RS analysis and interpretations. And so I have to acknowledge of their health and also thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks Baji and uh, a great talk and many interesting results. Yeah, do we have Thank a, you. <laughs> yeah, do we have some questions from the audience? Uh, okay, I, I will ask uh, ask one. You, you mentioned many chemical compounds, you know, from the mm -hmm. ethylpropanic to the biogenic uh, uh, and also to the comp combustion process is uh, produce the brown carbon and black carbon. So mm -hmm. which chemical compound do you think in reality, you know, in the in your city, in your university, or or, uh, or <clears throat> other cities which chemical compounds are most important <laughs> for the health effect of, of chem 2.5 that's a yeah. very good question and that's a very interesting question if i can answer for that question very accurately i will get an overpriced i think <laughs> <laughs> it's a very complex because as i mentioned before maybe we have to set out like which assay that we can use because in terms of the cell death, I can say some metal compounds will be the most important. But if we are saying the hydrogen radical formation, some other compounds are important matters. But generally, people said that metal and some conjugate, conjugated compounds are the important matter for the health effect. But actually, the, the other problem is that once it's in, inhaled in our body, there is a complex occurs. So I did experiments in the very pure conditions. We only surrogate certain amount of the compounds in our fluid and then we expose. But in the reality, particular matter is a mixture of the all different matters, right? So inside of the, our body, how those compounds interact together and what kind of symptoms will be shown from those interactions will be shown is a very difficult problem. But up to now, metal is the most important, and some conjugated compounds is the metal. But since you asked what's the important matter in Seoul, or maybe Seoul National University, well, cold study and our study shows that like vehicle emission and combustion is important matter. So some species emitted from those activity might be important matter, I think. Okay, okay. Uh, another point is, the photochemical aging of the biogenic and anthropogenic, the we will see. You 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 uh, you did a you did a lab experiments about two VOCs, and uh, they both produce the OH radical uh, mm -hmm. very significantly as a photochemical aging. So, is there any difference for the toxic toxicity of the SOV products from the anthropogenic and biogenic to oxidation? Uh, for the toluene alpha pine, yeah, we use different precursors representing yeah. anthropogenic, which is toluene, and then the uh, biogenic from the alpha pine. Well, actually, we were expecting so, to see some differences, and there's some actually absolute differences. Uh, but among, uh, actually, yeah, I, I confess, among our samples, actually, there's not much differences from toluene and alpha pine. But previous study shows that anthropogenic precursors such as toluene generate more amount of hydrogen peroxide not hydrogen radical. So maybe there are some differences among the oxidants that people are observing, but maybe there might be some difference because I mentioned before, different structure generate different types of uh, oxidants with a uh, different amount of oxidants. So there might be difference. But previous study shows that huge amount of difference was caused by the conjugated compound such as naphthalene. So maybe those are also kind of anthropogenic compounds, right? So if we compare some dramatic different compounds like the uh, PAH or some biogenic compounds, we could see some di huge difference, I guess. Uh, okay, another question. You you did, you did many source apportionment studies of, about this organic aerosol in Korea. So mm -hmm. Uh, how much how much of breast burning contribute to the total organic aerosol? Because oh yeah, biomass burning is significant. Actually, during spring and summer, there's a less amount of biomass burning. But starting from fall, actually, there's a uh, in total organic compounds about like. Uh, total 20 or maybe 15 to 20 percent of organic is coming from the biomass burning. Uh, when it is serious, significant, there's a two different types of biomass burning also observed. So it could be a significant source of organic as well as a significant source of the health effect, I guess. Thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, okay, another question is, 
Uh, because in your lab study, the, for, the, for example, the combustion processes, the concentration is really higher, you know, which are much mm. higher than ambient, ambient concentration. So how do mm. you comment, you know, the concentration difference affect your, 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 your health results? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, so yeah, combustion experiments and SOA formation experiments both generate a high amount of particular matter, so which will be different from the ambient conditions. So there is some kind of argue about is it is it real case to test the health effect? But actually, if we are thinking about the kind of long term exposure, so although the method is a little bit different, if we consider the long term exposure, maybe exposing high amount of mass or high amount of the combustion generated particles or high amount of the secondary organic aerosol could be uh, one of the approach that estimate the uh, long-term exposure effect. So for example, in the ambient, there's a small amount of biomass burning aerosol, right? However, if we keep if we if those particles are exposed to those people continuously for one month or two months, maybe total amount will be very high amount. So maybe if we can cover those amount by doing experiments, maybe that can uh, that can be comparable. Although the approach is a little bit different, but in terms of the long term exposure, high amount matter, high amount of the mass concentration is also kind of meaningful to compare with the health effect in real case. Okay, thanks, Hua Jie. That's it. Uh, we will move on to the next speaker. Mm, and, thank you. Uh, thank you. And our next speaker is Hu Jianlin. Uh, yeah, uh, let's give him a brief introduction. Hu Jianlin is a professor in the School of Environment Science and Engineering, Nanjing University of Information Science Technology. He uh, serves as the Deputy Dean of the school and the Deputy Director of Jiangsu Key Laboratory of uh, Atmospheric Environment Monitoring and Pollution Control. Uh, he received his PhD in atmospheric science from the University of California, Davis uh, in 2012. His main research interests include the development and application of air quality models, source portrait air pollution and health effect. He has published over more than, uh, more than 160 peer-reviewed papers, and he was awarded the Outstanding Young Scientist Award of China Society of Environmental Science in 2018, and also the uh, won the first prize of the China Environmental Protection Technology in 2022. So today he's talking about uh, this is the modeling particle number concentration in the in the China. Okay, welcome, Jenny. It's your time. Okay, can you hear me? Yellow. Yeah, I hear you. I can see you. Yeah. Okay. Good. You All right. Thank you for the introduction and uh, invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to. Uh, give my talk on modeling particle number concentrations in China. This is uh, a recent study uh, by my group. So I would like to start my presentation by uh, acknowledge my two students, um, Jian Jiong Mao and uh, Yan Hongzhu for contributing a lot of efforts uh, in this study. So um, before I start it, uh, I would like to give some background about this study. So uh, I think the two previous speakers have told us that particles have very important effects on health. And also we know particles play important role in climate and uh, particles have different properties, uh, mass concentrations, chemical compositions, sources, etc. And to characterize Characterize particles, we use different uh, metrics such as mass concentration, number concentration, and sometimes we uh, use area surface concentration as well. Um, and uh, different from mass concentration or surface area, number concentration of particles mainly uh, within 100 nanometer, which we refer to ultrafine particles. Uh, there are emerging evidence that showing the artifact particles may have greater health impacts. So in the WHO, uh, the latest release on the global air quality guidelines in 2021, actually they suggest that we should uh, monitor artifact particles 
especially for the particle number concentrations. Also, when the small particles grow up to 50 to 80 nanometer, they can uh, become uh, cloud condensation nuclei. So that will affect cloud properties and then we'll have important climate effects. And uh, so it's important to understand the particle number concentrations in addition to their mass. And similar to the mass of particles, there are two sources, two major sources for a number of concentrations. One is the direct emissions from different sources. Some sources are uh, nature uh, activities such as wildfires, sea salt, dust, and also we have uh, anthropogenic sources of number like traffic, industry, uh, residential uh, activities. And in addition to the direct emissions, we have secondary formation of the uh, particles, uh, which we re refer to new particle formation. And uh, field studies already revealed that uh, particle number concentration can increase by 10 to 100 times due to new particle formation. And this particle formation uh, also can impact the mass concentration when they grow up and then much more gas species can condense on the existing particles. So, uh, so it's important uh, to do that. And uh, so we did some literature survey on, on the modeling studies on the particle number concentrations. So this is a, a brief uh, summary here. And here we only uh, focus on the air quality model studies. Uh, so uh, like the climate models that is not included here. So you can see that the, uh, the modeling study on particle number concentrations. Uh, so the num so first the numbers uh, are much less than the, uh, the, the modeling studies on mass con concentrations. Uh, so there are already some studies on global scale, on regional scale, uh, either in a European region, um, North America and Asia. So there are some, um, the, and we use uh, different models like GeoScan, CMAC, and uh, WolfCam, uh, NACUM, uh, CAMEX, uh, and the focus mainly on the evaluation of the model uh, performance and uh, uh, emission and source contributions, also the nucleation uh, impacts. And in this, in this studies, the, the, the you know, nucleation mainly focus on binary schemes, ternary uh, schemes, some activation, uh, parameterization, uh, organic uh, nucleation uh, schemes, etc. And uh, in addition to the number of studies, we also find that the performance of current air quality models on number of concentrations uh, is uh, much worse than how the model uh, can perform for the mass concentrations. So the, here we list the, uh, the performance in this table. And uh, if you're familiar with the uh, modeling study, we use uh, different uh, statistical metrics to characterize the modeling uh, capability on, on, on mass concentrations and number concentrations. And the, the two often used uh, metrics are normalized mean bias, normalized mean errors, and for reference, uh, the, the NMB, NME uh, for mass concentrations usually within like uh, uh, plus minus 0.35. So if you, we compare the numbers uh, here uh, to that criteria, you, you, we find the model performance on number concentrations are more, much worse. So you can find the number numbers can way up to like over, uh, like for the CMAC, the, the number can be way up to 95 or 12.5. That means the model uh, 
under predict or, or, or significantly over predict number considerations a lot. So uh, we use CMAC uh, in the past to study uh, PM25 mass concentrations and sources in China uh, for many years. And we did an initial test on how CMAC model can, can perform for the number concentrations. So this is the uh, initial test result. Um, so uh, we modeled a period uh, in March to April uh, in 2016 in Beijing, uh, which we obtained some number of observations. You can clearly see that the model under predicts the number of students a lot. Also, we did another test that we turned off the nucleation in the default CMAC model, which is a binary nucleation uh, scheme. So uh, with, without nucleation, you know, the numbers is even lower, but you know, the both cannot ex explain the, the number of concentration of positions as, as well. So, so we need to do something if we want to use CMAC to model uh, the number of concentrations and to do some, some health study later on. So that is the purpose of our study. So uh, we did some uh, improvement in the model. We uh, incorporated three uh, other different nucleation schemes into the CMAC model. Uh, here, first is the binary scheme, which is actually already included in the CMAC model. Uh, this based on the uh, concentration of sulfic acid, also considering the effects of temperature and relative humidity. Uh, because of the time, I won't go details about the parameterization in, in, in the model. Uh, for the, th the first one we added to the CMAC model is the uh, ternary nucleation scheme, which you know is uh, considering the effect of ammonia and uh, sulfuric acid. So uh, here is the parameterization, uh, the, the equations. And the second one is the um, mediated nucleation scheme, and we are, uh, we added this parameterization uh, based on uh, Yu functions, uh, Professor Yu's uh, study in 2018 and 2020, um, which considering the nucleation not only based on the uh, sulfic acid and ammonia concentration, but also considering the effect of our surface area and uh, atmospheric ionization rates. So we uh, we use the lookup table method uh, to to get the nucleation rates and growth rate. And the third one we incorporate into the CMAC model uh, is the uh, sulfic acid and uh, dimethylamine uh, nucleation scheme. Uh, so we call DMA uh, scheme. So which uh, based on the observation study uh, from Yao in 2018 and modern study uh, from Zhao in 2021. Uh, which considering the uh, nucleation rates based on the concentration of sulfuric acid and DMA. Of course, you know, in the default CMAC model, we don't have DMA in, in the model. So to do that, we need to add the emissions of DMA and also the chemistry of DMA uh, in the model as well. So we, uh, we did some research and to use the uh, uh, message in youth uh, study in published in 2014, which uh, estimates the uh, DMA emissions based on ammonia emissions, you know, uh, giving a fixed ratio and we scale that uh, the, the DMA emissions based on ammonia. And we also incorporate the uh, DMA chemistry with uh, OS, OH radicals and into the CMAC model so that we can get the DMA uh, concentrations. Uh, and with all that change, then we uh, did some uh, model applications in China. 
uh, we uh, modeled two uh, episodes. One is uh, 2016, uh, 2016 um, April uh, in Beijing, and also the other one is uh, 2018 April in Nanjing. So the figure shows here why is for Beijing area, why is for Nanjing area. Beijing is in the north part of China, and the Nanjing is in the uh, in, in, in the middle part of China. So they have different environment, uh, climate, uh, and also the emissions are very different. And we model the two episode two locations to see if the skins we incorporate into the model can well. Uh, simulate the number of concentrations in different locations, different uh, seasons, different years in, in China. So for emissions in this application, we use um, uh, make emission inventory, which developed developed by Tsinghua University, uh, using a lot of uh, local uh, data uh, in China. And for for the regions outside China, we use uh, real uh, emission inventory. And for for uh, biogenic emissions, we use Megan, and wildfire, we use FIM uh, emission inventory. And we did uh, six, seven cases uh, simulations, and the four cases was the uh, were the four individual nucleation skins, binary, ternary, uh, IM mediated nucleation, and uh, DMA nucleation skins. And we did another one with no nucleation at all. And we did another two combined cases. One is combined binary, ternary, and DMA together. One is uh, combined uh, the uh, in, uh, ion mediated uh, with uh, DMA schemes. Because there's uh, some evidence that showing you know, multiple pathways can exist uh, in the same time. So um, uh, this is some results, and uh, so uh, for the for the top row is Beijing's result. For the uh, lower uh, row is Nanjing's result uh, for diff for the seven cases. So you can see that you know, with the new new no nucleation or the default skins, CMAC underpredict the concentrations a lot both in Beijing and Nanjing. And if we incorporate ternary, uh, IM and DMA, the performance get improved, especially for Beijing, the IM and uh, nucleation can uh, get the number concentrations uh, very good, and uh, uh, which is similar to another study in Beijing. And uh, for Nanjing, and even with all these seven cases, the number of concentrations still underpredicted. Uh, and that means maybe we still have some important um, nucleation mechanisms missing in the current uh, settings. And that is for the total number concentration. And now let's look at the, the concentrations in different sizes. So uh, we uh, look at the number concentrations in icon uh, mode and uh, accumulation mode. So um, we find that you know the different nucleation schemes have uh, very little effects on the number of concentrations in um, accumulation mode. That is not makes sense because that the concentrations in the relative, relatively uh, coarse particles, uh, the concentration is low and uh, less impact by the new particle formation, and uh, the impact of different uh, schemes have very large uh, impacts on the acting mode number concentration. Um, and uh, if, you, if you look at Nanjing results, so there's some very high peak number concentrations in the observations, but we miss that in any of the seven cases. So we further uh, summarize you know, in, the, uh, in, in, in the combined cases, which skins has uh, has how much uh, contributions to the total number of concentrations? So we find uh, in the in Beijing that the IM mediated nucleations can contribute uh, 
56 percent of total number uh, concentrations, uh, which is the biggest uh, contribution. And the DMA nucleation contributes to about uh, 29 percent. But if the, the, the contributions in, in of the different skins and also emissions uh, varies in different days. And in the end of the episode, early April, as the contribution from DMA nucleation becomes more important compared to the IMN nucleation. But in Nanjing, it's a different story. The DMA contributes uh, about 36%, uh, which is larger than the IIMN nucleation, which contributes 25%. Also, we find the two different nucleation screens actually contribute differently in uh, in different time. DMA dominates nighttime nucleation, and IMN nucleation dominates the daytime nucleation. With that, we also did another uh, further study on the uh, on on the isopogenic uh, emissions of DMA on the particle number consistencies. Because uh, we collaborated with some uh, experimental uh, study uh, scientists, and uh, they did uh, studies that measured the DMA concentrations in in Shanghai, uh, which illustrate on the up corner result uh, figure. That you can see the the DMA concentrations in Shanghai is higher in urban center. And the concentration actually is well correlated with population density, which indicating that the, the emissions of DMA may come from some uh, anthropogenic activities. Uh, so uh, later on, they find that is mostly likely uh, from the septic tank used in, in China. And then, uh, based on that study, we develop a emission inventory of organic amine emissions from residential sources, and then uh, put into the CMAG model we just developed uh, with the IMN and DMA nucleation schemes to quantify uh, the contribution, the impacts of the anthropogenic emissions of DMA on um, particle numbers. And here's the result, you know, so uh, the first row is uh, uh, the initial emissions of uh, DMA. So you can see in the urban center that the, the anthropogenic really dominates the DMA emissions. And if we put into the DMA emissions into the model, the number of concentrations will go up a lot, especially in the downtown, in the urban center. And in the bottom row is the number of concentrations. So uh, as a summary, we find that re the residential sources could contribute more than 70% of particle number concentrations in uh, urban centers in, of Shanghai. So that is very important contribution. So uh, with that, I would like to sum summarize my uh, study. Uh, this is just a, a, a preliminary uh, study. There's a lot of things uh, need to be done, but in, in this uh, study, we incorporate uh, three different uh, nucleation schemes into CMAC, and we find if we incorporate the IMN and DMA nucleation schemes uh, can improve CMAC capability to model number concentrations in China for two different episodes. And uh, we also find that for different locations, different times, the dominant location schemes uh, could be different. And of course, there's a lot of things need to be done in the future, like um, there should be some uh, important missing location uh, schemes in the current model. Um, maybe some organic involved nucleation. Uh, or, and the other thing is about the emissions, about particle number concentration. Right now, there's no national or any public emission inventory about particle numbers. So that is a huge uncertainty on, on, on the model inputs. Also, the, right now, the particle growth process is still uh, not complete in the model. So we need to work on that uh, in the future as well. 
Okay, that's all my uh, talk. And at last, I would like to thank my uh, research support from uh, three uh, different projects. And also, and the most importantly, I would like to thank my two students, Jian Jing and uh, uh, Yan Hong, for their efforts in, uh, in this study. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I would like to okay, thanks, Julian. Very important work. You know, the, the simulating particle number concentration actually is very challenging. So we have a question from the audience. What do you think? What is more... Oh, not this one. Did IMN yield depend on the environment or location? If yes, please, with specific examples. Can you explain more? IMN... Uh, can you repeat the question? I, I didn't hear the first part. Yeah, the did IMM mechanism depend on the environment or the location? If yes, yes of course, it depends because on the location. Some examples or explain more. Yeah, because you know the I mean, uh, the nucleation. There's um, diff, there's uh, several parameters that involved in this nucleation schemes, like the concentration of uh, sulfuric acid, ammonia. And beyond that, it is also affected by the aerosol uh, surface area and uh, atmospheric ionization rates. So they're both you know, very different in different locations. So that is really different in different locations. So you know, from our results, we also see the ion depletion uh, rate in, like, in Beijing and Nanjing, they are different. So yeah, I think that the simple answer is yes. OK. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our two previous talks, you know, Professor Khan mentioned, you know, the, the total PM2.5 mass and the Professor Hua Jin, you know, mentioned the chemical composition and uh, you talked about the particle number concentration. So my question is, how do you connect your particle number concentrations with the health studies? Well, uh, that I think there are already some uh, efforts already try to uh, try to do the health op opact, uh, effects of uh, um, Particles using number concentration as the as the exposure uh, matrix, and uh, there's already some uh, results published. I think the problem is the particle number concentration varies strongly in spatial, uh, which is hard to do some very uh, stable uh, exposure assessment. Much more difficult than mass. Also, you know, the measurements for particle numbers, uh, especially for the uh, small size particles, is challenging. So, um, but uh, I think there's there's strong evidence that showing the artifact particles have may, may have even larger health impacts. So th there's a lot of things need to be done in the future. I think uh, to do that, we need to combine measurements and modeling efforts together maybe some uh, you know future maybe some uh remote sensing method as well so there's then there's a lot of things needed to be done okay yeah another question is why is the nucleation mechanism between nanjing and beijing is so different you know from your simulation results you know the imn the contribution of the imn is so different okay yeah, because Nanjing and Beijing is totally different. You know, Beijing is in, in, located in the in the north part, and Nanjing located in the south part. So the concentrations of SO2 and other precursors are different, and the particle uh, surface area is different. That's the, the the first one, and the the climate is different as well. The temperature, relative humidity, you know, is pretty dry in in Beijing and in, in March, April. And but in, in Nanjing is pretty humid during April, and so so everything is different. That remind us, you know, this in different locations with different environments, the nucleation uh, should be different. And I think uh, that that is uh, one reason why we need to uh, do some uh, specific specific uh, studies in different locations. Okay, the, the final question. You, know, you mentioned that the, the emission inventory or the particle number concentrations is missing. So how did you, how did you treat your 
the part uh, the emission inventory or your particle number concentration, you know, mainly okay. from the primary sources. Right. Okay. So as I said, uh, in China right now, there's no uh, emission inventory estimate uh, for particle numbers. Um, as as far as I know, there's only one uh, particle number emission inventory uh, developed in Europe, uh, not even in the United States. Uh, so we to, to do the modeling, we have to estimate the number of emissions uh, based on the mass, uh, e emission of mass. So we have the emission inventory uh, for PM uh, mass and we convert the mass into number by assuming the size di distribution. So we uh, we we, we uh, took uh, different size distribution for different sources, and uh, to estimate uh, the number of emissions from different sources, and then combine together. That is a simple way to say it. But anyway, okay. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jelly. Thanks. Uh, okay. We will move Thank to you. the next speaker. Uh, yeah, our topic is also moving from the particular matter to the ozone. So our next speaker is Professor Gao Meng. He's an assistant professor of Hong Kong uh, Baptist University. He received his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Iowa in 2015. And then he did his postdoc research at Harvard University. Uh, his research mainly focus on the uh, atmospheric chemistry and uh, climate modeling, chemistry climate interactions, and uh, climate change mitigation. He has published more than 100 peer reviewed uh, papers, including science advances, PNAS, and uh, the BAMS. He also received multiple awards, including the Xie Bing Yang's Meteorological Science and Technology Award, and also the EGU Atmospheric Science Division. Outstanding young scientist in 2020, and uh, he is the fellow of the Royal the Royal Meteorological Society, and uh, he is also a member of the WMO Global Air Quality Forecasting and Information uh, System Steering Committee. So today he is talking about the occurrence of the heat and ozone extremes in China, amplified trends, seasonal prediction, and interactive health effects. This is also a very hot topic uh, now. Professor Gao, uh, it's your time. Hi. Uh, thank you, Professor Sun, for the uh, nice introduction and uh, the invitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, have this uh, chance to present at this uh, Environmental Research 2023. Uh, uh, as mentioned by Professor Sun, now um, in the previous several um, talks, we heard a lot about PM, including uh, mass concentration and the number concentration right now. Um, talking about the co-occurrence of heat and uh, air pollution extremes, especially ozone pollution in China, uh, amplify trends, seasonal prediction, and uh, interactive health effects. And uh, uh, these studies were done mostly by uh, two of my PhD students, Xiao Xiang and uh, Wang Fan. So uh, I think you have noticed uh, from news where you uh, perceived directly from yourself last year, uh, it was uh, really hot. The left panel shows the um, NASA recorded extreme heat on July 13th, 2022. You can see on that day, uh, in most areas of the globe, uh, temperature reached about uh, 40 Celsius degree, uh, especially in northern part of Africa, uh, Middle East and northern part of India, and also uh, middle part of uh, China. And uh, more seriously, this year, um, we just um, passed like the July 2023 20, was recorded as the um, hottest month in uh, history. Uh, the temperature of July 20, uh, sorry, there's type of here. Uh, July 2023 20, was uh, almost like 0 0.24, just to be higher, higher than any records and uh, one point, about 1.2, just to be higher than that of uh, the period over uh, 1951 to uh, 1980. And also we see from the uh, bottom panel here shows the uh, information uh, from China Climate Change Report. Uh, it shows that last year the um, like frequency of uh, 
extreme heat events in China was much, much higher than any previous years. And this year, the data hasn't been released. I believe that this year we can reach to another high point here. And uh, why do we care about uh, heat extremes? We already know a lot from both news and uh, literature that uh, rise in uh, temperature was associated with uh, rise in deaths. Uh, in addition to that, also the uh, heat heat wave sometimes coincides with uh, drought events, which can also affect uh, uh, food security, the growth of crops and food security. And uh, here in the uh, middle panel, it shows a study published last year by uh, Peter Sherman. They look at uh, how uh, future climate would affect uh, the usage of life safer air conditioner in different countries or regions. You can, uh, the red lines shows the current um, capacity, air, capacity of air, air conditioning and the blue uh, curve and red curve represent the current climate and the future climate. You can see like in uh, most regions except uh, Japan and the United States uh, and uh, South and South Korea, in most regions, the current capacity of air conditioning would not be sufficient to support uh, uh, like the hotter uh, future, especially for developing regions like uh, uh, South America or South Africa. And in addition to that, uh, heat wave also could affect the occurrences of wildfire, which is great concern as a scientist in air quality. So that's the focus of our study. We would like to explore how uh, heat wave and air pollution in, uh, affect each other. Um, the top panel uh, on the left, it shows the camps predict high ozone on a um, Heat, heat wave event. If you look at the spatial distribution, you can see like those uh, areas with uh, super high ozone concentrations coincidence with the um, high, uh, high near ground high temperature, which is uh, mainly caused by the uh, persistent high pressure pressure system, which can uh, bring uh, hot a uh, warm air from uh, southern regions to northern regions. And this kind of high pressure system could persist for a while. As a result, um, emissions of um, uh, em em emissions of uh, precursors could accumulate there. And under high temperature, they um, photochemical reaction will be accelerated. So as a result, uh, when uh, high temperature happens, it could actually affect uh, formation of pollution um, from different pathways. Uh, for example, the high temperature could enhance biogenic emissions of VOC and also it could affect uh, wildfire uh, emissions. And uh, this kind of feedback have been uh, well documented previously. And here we are more interested in the uh, co-occurrence of heat and air pollution uh, extremes. Uh, in a study published by um, Chanel and Prather at uh, UC Irvine in 2017 PS, they look at the co-occurrence of ozone, uh, PM, and uh, heat extremes. Uh, there are co-occurrences in uh, in the eastern part of the United States. You can see the condition in the U.S. that um, ozone and peak and PM could happen uh, together uh, frequently in the United States. And also uh, when uh, temperature uh, is higher. This kind of co-occurrence is also obvious in some regions of the United States. But the, the condition for uh, China is a little bit uh, different um, because the um, primary emissions of PM in the uh, US is not as high as uh, China. Some Under some circumstances, the um, both PM and uh, ozone formation is mainly driven by the uh, stronger atom, uh, oxidation capacity of the atmosphere. But in China, we observe a different seasonality of PM and uh, ozone. For PM25 concentrations, it's peaked in um, winter time, but uh, shows loss value in summertime. And also, uh, we know that since uh, 2013, uh, due to the stringent emission control measures implemented by our 
government uh, PM25 concentration had been uh, declining uh, rapidly. At the same time, uh, we know that um, ozone concentration has been an uh, increasing issue for uh, China. Uh, this is uh, our uh, the study done by uh, my, my PhD student Xiaoxiang published uh, last year in uh, BAMS. First, we look at um, the individual trend of the uh, occurrence of uh, uh, heat, ozone, and the PM25 uh, existence days um, over the period of 2013 to uh, 2020. So in this study, we uh, consider the, uh, the impacts of relative humidity on, um, on, on temperature. We use this uh, wet bulb temperature definition to define um, the occurrence of uh, uh, hot days. Uh, because uh, in some regions like uh, southern China, we don't often see temperature goes um, goes beyond 30 Celsius degree, but uh, uh, due to the uh, very high relative humidity around like 70, 80 uh, percent here, uh, we, the apparent temperature can be as serious as like uh, above 40 Celsius degree. So that's why we use um, this wet bulb temperature to account for the impacts of relative humidity here. And we define um, uh, temp uh, temperature and ozone and PM25 existence by the definition if the wet bulb temperature is uh, higher or equal to 25 Celsius degree, then we define that day as an um, existence day. And uh, for PM25 ozone, we use the standard by the government. And uh, then we can, if you look at the spatial map of these individual trends, you can see like uh, PM25 uh, declined a lot in most, most of the stations in eastern part of China. But uh, uh, for ozone, you can see uh, con consistently uh, consistent enhancement in uh, eastern part of China. And in, for um, temperature, we also observe enhancement in most of the stations. And then we look at the trend of a core occurrence of these three uh, health stressors together. And the left panel four plus uh, show um, temperature and ozone, uh, PM25 and ozone uh, temperature and PM25 and these three uh, combined together. We, you see like any combination involving a PM25 uh, declined because of the uh, changes in emissions over this study period. But uh, uh, the co-occurrence of um, wet bulb temperature and uh, ozone uh, increased over this period over most stations in uh, China. We further calculate the um, like the enhancement ratio for two regions, uh, the Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei, and uh, Yangtze River Delta region. Uh, we see that this kind of uh, co-occurrence uh, didn't actually account for large fraction of all days uh, of a year. But if you look at the um, enhancement um, rate, we find actually for both of these regions, the um, inc inc the enhanced in percentage increase of uh, this kind of co-occurrence is higher than the individual one. It actually uh, gives us some implications for the uh, future uh, because uh, right now, right now, on if you look at the absolute value, is not that significant, but uh, um, under warming climate and the much higher uh, percentage increase rate, it is very likely that this kind of occurrence co will be a serious issue in the future. And we need to uh, be careful about that. We need to be careful about that. Um, the most important reason is uh, the implications for health. And we would like to know if this kind of uh, exposure to coal um, extremes uh, likely to amplify the health consequence beyond the sum of individual or not. And with this question, we uh, collaborated with uh, Sing Yat-sen University to use their uh, cohort study data on uh, preterm births to look at this uh, problem. And here shows some background information of uh, the cohort uh, study, it includes the population and the design. Uh, in this cohort study, they uh, recruited mothers over the period of uh, 2018 to uh, 2020. Uh, in total, there were 
um, more than 100,000 mothers uh, were recruited. And uh, because some records were missing and we did some uh, quality control on the uh, raw data first, and eventually we still got more than 100,000 uh, samples in this study. And then we uh, match the period with environmental uh, air pollutant measurements and also uh, temperature from real analysis data. Also in this uh, cohort study, they actually uh, considered different uh, background information of those mothers, including their age, um, uh, like their, their, their age, their uh, education level, or their um, like in environmental tobacco exposure level, because all these kind of uh, factors could be confounding factors to affect the results. And we used some statistical analysis method to exclude these impacts. And then uh, in the analysis, we um, consider different uh, trimesters of pregnancy, um, the first, second, and third, uh, to, to see uh, which period would contribute more to health impacts. And then uh, we first used the uh, GAMS model to look at the uh, potential threshold effect and then we calculate the relative risk for uh, individual uh, exposure. And more, in more importantly, we use, um, uh, like use, use, we calculate this IERI uh, index, which uh, means the relative access risk due to interaction. Uh, if this uh, value is higher than zero, it means that the combined effects are higher than uh, that of each alone. If it is uh, smaller than that, it means that uh, it doesn't have this kind of syn synergistic effect. Uh, first, we look at the in, uh, relative risk due to individual exposure. You can see uh, for air pollutants like uh, PM2, PM2.5, uh, NO2, and ozone, we observe uh, relatively stable uh, relative risk when the concentration is uh, much lower, but uh, when the concentration is going higher, we can observe the relative risk is uh, uh, go, is going higher. But for temperature, is a little bit different. We observe like a U-shape uh, relative risk um, at a temperature around 18 Celsius degree. It shows the lowest uh, relative risk. But uh, when temperature is going lower than that or higher than that, the relative risk is going higher. That means. Uh, at both uh, extreme low temperature or extreme high temperature, it can uh, in increase uh, relative risk of uh, the exposure of temperature. And then we look at the uh, synergistic effects uh, of exposure to uh, co-extremes. And we only summarize uh, the combination with higher, uh, with amplified uh, health risk here. Uh, we find, actually, eventually we found three uh, combinations including uh, PM25 with uh, uh, hot with high temperature, ozone with low temperature, and uh, ozone with uh, high temperature, and we also um, found like uh, similar um, examinations in literature that uh, uh, at a relatively higher uh, temperature it could enhance like evaporation of some uh, toxic components of PM25, for example, like organics, which could uh, actually increase uh, health uh, impacts. And for uh, ozone, because it's a very strong um, like oxidative uh, effects, it could uh, probably like uh, synergistically work with both low and temperature to enhance the uh, health impacts. And this work has already uh, been published in ERL this year. And then I, we already know that this kind of uh, coal occurrence is, is very likely to be amplified in the future. And also, we know that exposure to this kind of cold stressors could um, enhance the uh, health risks. Uh, another issue, another question is how we could avoid this kind of uh, exposure. Then we conducted another uh, study to uh, understand, to, to trying to understand the driving factors for the uh, cold occurrence. And, uh, um, would like to know if we could potentially uh, predict this kind of co-occurrence so that we could avoid exposure to that. And uh, for this study, we um, also, we because this is kind of study for China, we uh, use the CMA 
uh, definition of uh, heat waves and also uh, similar to previous study, we use the uh, Ministry of Ecology and the Environment air quality standard to define uh, ozone existence days. And then um, first we use satellite to reconstruct daily uh, ozone ground level ozone concentrations first, and then we calculate uh, co-occurrence of both um, ozone existence days and uh, uh, heat wave existence days. So then eventually we got this uh, um, spatial and uh, interannual vari vari uh, variations of this kind of uh, co-occurrence. Uh, if you look at the uh, map here, you can uh, see like the co-occurrence is mainly concentrated in uh, northern, it's very strong in the annual uh, valuation. We also um, evaluate uh, how um, heat wave days and ozone existence contribute to this kind of co-occurrence. We find that uh, co-occurrence happens uh, predominantly on heat wave days. And uh, uh, for all ozone pollution days, it's kind of about 50%. Once we have this kind of uh, spatial and uh, temporal variations, we can uh, we follow our previous study to do uh, seasonal uh, pre to do se seasonal prediction of air pollution in uh, northern in, in northern India. So in our previous study, we um, use satellite AOD uh, data in winter time in northern part of India, and we applied EOF analysis to find the uh, dominant modes, and we're trying to uh, connect these dominant nodes with some uh, physical meanings. We found the spatial distribution of correlation of the first dominant uh, mode was uh, resembles the um, like uh, sea surface temperature anomalies of El Nino, and uh, we we saw this kind of pattern was associated with El Nino, and we did some uh, statistics analysis and new model simulations confirmed the connection and we found the second one only shows significant correlations in southern hemisphere and uh, SAM were, is the only dominant climate mode in southern hemisphere and we saw like the second mode was associated with the SAM. And then we use this kind of information because this uh, um, spatial correlation could persist from um, like fall to uh, winter. We can actually use the um, CFS temperature anomalies in four to predict uh, winter time AOD. Uh, th this was the model uh, built for that period, and we further used the disk analysis and uh, uh, CSM um, perturbation runs to confirm the uh, association. Um, if you are interested in this, we can uh, talk about this uh, later online, uh, offline. Uh, so for this study, we actually follow the same uh, methodology. We first we use uh, uh, EOF analysis to uh, apply it on the um, like uh, construct constructed co-occurrence fields, and it has both. And we found the uh, first three dominant modes. Uh, unlike the AOD air pollution study, we didn't find a very strong signal of the second and third mode, but the first mode was uh, um, quite quite significant, about 36% of the variance. And if you look at the temporal uh, variability, we uh, found it interesting that in May and in uh, June, no, no, in June and July and August, it actually show uh, opposite uh, responses of the co-occurrence in. Um, in June, we see um, for the first domi dominate uh, mode, we found like a negative impact, but for uh, August and July, we found positive impact. And uh, later, we found this kind of um, changes was associated with the uh, movement of the rain, rain belt from uh, the Yangtze River Delta region to uh, northern part of India region. And if you look at the spatial distribution of the impacts, it also shows like opposite opposite sign. It means that the first uh, climate pattern actually could uh, lead to lower co-occurrence in northern part of in, uh, northern part of China, but uh, uh, increase the co-occurrence in areas uh, to the south. And then uh, we we were trying to understand the what, what were the underlying physical meaning of the first, uh, first second, and so third uh, 
uh, climate patterns, we found we did a lot of analysis with some mythological uh, variables, and we found that the first uh, the PC1 um, principal component uh, first actually was associated with uh, weakened Western Pacific uh, subtropic high, but uh, strengthened and uh, North Pacific subtropic high. And this kind of uh, um, pattern could actually change like the water, water vapor uh, transport to northern part of India and the southern part of India. And as, as a result, we observe uh, opposite uh, directions uh, opposite responses of uh, uh, shuttle wave radiation and the precipitation in uh, northern China and uh, southern China. For example, like the first pattern could actually uh, increase uh, precipitation in uh, northern China, but uh, decrease precipitation uh, to uh, southern China. This is, this is actually consistent with the spatial distribution of uh, uh, UF1 shows a decline in core occurrence in this part, but in enhancement uh, to the south of that. And to further uh, confirm this kind of uh, connection uh, with core currents, we also um, conducted uh, CSM uh, experiments. We perturbed the uh, sea surface temperature anomaly in the model and used the atmospheric model to run, uh, to calculate ozone concentrations and uh, uh, temperature. Uh, once we have the model outputs, we can further calculate uh, core occurrence of uh, uh, heat and uh, ozone existence. And uh, you can see for the first dominant road, the, it actually shows, um, because we only perturbate uh, sea surface temperature of a relatively small region, as a result, the response of the space distribution uh, shifted a little bit, but we can still see like it kind of uh, decline the core currents in northern part of India, but uh, increase uh, in the areas to the source. And the second, uh, uh, third mode was associated with the uh, movement, uh, southward and northward movement of the um, uh, West, uh, West Pacific subtropic high. And based on this information, we uh, followed the previous study, like uh, because this kind of uh, sea surface anomaly could persist from across seasons, we use uh, springtime sea surface anomaly to predict the core currents in fall time. And uh, at last, I would like to uh, further uh, emphasize the importance of uh, health co uh, stressors. We know that uh, right now, uh, not just China, including India governments were trying to um, push to uh, reduce emissions of uh, air pollutants. You can, if you look at the uh, concentrations uh, in China, PM declined a lot, but uh, for core, core occurrences, it's very likely uh, due to changes in the uh, circulation patterns or local meteorological conditions, it's very likely like the uh, core occurrence would uh, increase even at a lower uh, emissions of air pollutants. And we, in our study, we already know that uh, exposure to these kind of co stressors could have larger health impacts. So we need to pay attention to uh, this kind of issue and uh, um, hope, hope to do something, especially um, reducing uh, more occurrences of heat wave in the future to uh, deal with this issue. Um, that's all my presentation today. Thank you. OK, that's a very nice talk. and. Uh... Do we have any question from the audience? Uh, okay, no, uh, I will ask one. <clears throat> yeah, There's, there are more frequent wave, uh, heat waves over the world and even in China. So in terms of climate change and uh, also the emission control, do you have any suggestions for the ozone mitigation in the China? Um, for also mitigation in terms of like this is this is a very compli complicated uh, question like for ozone mitigations right now uh, the government can only uh, account for like the influences of uh, precursors including uh, nitrogen oxides or uh, VOC but uh, for uh, extreme conditions like heat wave it's a different story um, I think under these very extreme conditions even uh, the con emissions are at a very low level, the exceedance could still, of ozone could still happen. 
and uh, but like controlling uh, regulating this kind of uh, extreme occurrence still rely on uh, greenhouse gases but this may take a longer time to achieve yeah okay thanks uh another question is uh you didn't mention the pm 2.5 so what's the role of pm 2.5 uh, in the heat wave uh, between the heat waves and the ozone pollution, because some studies they found the decrease of PM two point five also increased the ozone, and the, the heat waves. You know, if the heat wave the temperature is higher, then the boundary layer is higher, and then PM two point five is low. So, uh, what's the role of the PM two point five in the in the middle? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And uh, for PM two five is a little bit uh, different. And also, you mentioned like in some uh, cases. It's, I think the response of PM25 could vary uh, with locations because in some regions, if it is more like a secondary dominated, it's likely like will be uh, increased. But for um, some regions, also like uh, uh, when heat wave happens, it's very likely boundary layer height or the convection would be stronger, which could lower the concentration in some locations. And I think this uh, this is an interesting topic. Like deserve more further studies. Okay, okay. Thanks, Mo. Uh, yeah, we will you. move to the thank final you. speaker. Okay. Yeah, our final speaker is Wang Chen. Uh, she's an associate professor at the School of Environment, uh, Environment at the Southern University of Science and Technology. She received her PhD in Environment Chemistry in University of Toronto in 2016, and she did her. She did her postdoc at the same university. Her research mainly focused on the behavior of pollutants, multiphase chemistry, and the chemical transformation and the difference between the indoor and the outdoor atmospheric chemistry. She has published over more than 30 peer reviewed papers, including science advances, environmental science and technology. Uh, she was selected as MIT Civil and Environmental Engineering Rising Star. 2019 and also selected as atmospheric chemistry called premium for emerging senior scientists in 2017. So her topic will move from the outdoors to the indoors. And today she's talking about uh, the air pollution and multiphase atmospheric chemistry in indoor environments. Okay, welcome, Professor Wang. Yes, it's your time. Yes. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of my research in the past few years on indoor um, air pollution and uh, chemistry happening in the indoor environment. And um, I, I guess at the end of the session, people have uh, listened to a couple of talks on air quality. And I believe people uh, know that air quality is related to health. So here, I just want to emphasize that um, among these top factors affecting human health, air pollution is uh, one of them, and that includes um, that that includes both uh, indoor air and outdoor air. So, for example, in twenty seventeen, air pollution was responsible for nearly five million deaths. So, this is why we're studying indoor air quality. Um, showing here two pie charts, one is for um, US, one is for Canada. And you can see that uh, for the amount of time people spend indoors, um, it's basically similar, um, 80 over 80%, close to 90%. And that um, means a, a lot of our exposure indoors, uh, a, a lot of our exposure to air pollution actually happens in the indoor environment. And recently, um, the U.S. National Academy actually uh, wrote a report to emphasize when indoor chemistry matters. So this is one of the uh, cover page. And similarly, uh, in EST, there is um, papers on emphasizing the importance of indoor chemistry. So uh, this is what I'm going to talk today on um, indoor chemistry. And I want to briefly introduce what I mean. Uh, here showing on the left is a cartoon showing a lot of pollutants indoors, for example, volatile organic compounds, uh, semi-volatile organic compounds, VOCs and SVOCs. 
Uh, different from the outdoor environment, indoor has a lot of surface area. So these chemicals in the air can uh, partition to surfaces. And also uh, having an equilibrium partitioning between particles and indoor air. Uh, in addition to this distribution, there are also oxidants in the indoor environment. For example, ozone, OH, NOx, and others. So these uh, chemicals indoors can participate in reaction processes. And uh, additionally, we can see their indoor light sources and there will be sunlight passing through the window going into the indoor environment and chemicals are in exchange with the indoor and outdoor. So overall, indoor chemistry actually is the multi-phase chemical processes of gases, surfaces and particles. And these are affecting our human chemical exposure and um, pollutant exchange between indoor and outdoor air. And here today, I will just show some of my research interest. So two, two topics um, I'm going to talk about. The first half is about partitioning processes in the indoor environment. So, um, for example, how the gas phase compounds distribute between particles and surfaces. And on the second half of the talk, I will present some work on reactive processes indoors. So for chemicals in the indoor environment, will they undergo reaction to produce uh, secondary particles and secondary VLCs? And hopefully at the end of the talk, you will get some um, uh, interesting ideas uh, from this talk on partitioning and reactive processes in the indoor environment. Um, so on the first topic, um, I will show a few um, small projects on the topic of indoor gas surface interaction. So as I mentioned earlier that um, in the indoor environment, there are a lot of surface reservoirs. So for example, they could be uh, the building materials, uh, furnishings, all chemicals formed on surfaces build up uh, fumes. So for example, emissions from all these sources can emit chemicals indoors and they will uh, distribute into the surface. And this process is, controls um, indoor air concentration and can change exposure pathway. And I, um, I would like to introduce how these gas surface partitioning um, influence volatile compounds um, indoors. So this showing um, here is a result, um, part of a study called home, home cam. So it was uh, conducted in a house in Texas, Austin. And during one of the experiments, we did enhanced ventilation. So the plot here on the left is the mixing ratio of uh, selected species. And the um, X axis is time. And the blue color shows indoor mixing ratio. You, you can see that in the shade area is one we do enhanced ventilation, uh, just, like, just simply open the windows, open the doors. And you saw, you can see a drop of signals when uh, the house is ventilated. And when the house is closed, you will see an increase of the chemical species concentration. And this has been repeated a few times and it shows uh, similar behavior. So what we think uh, is there are very large surface and fast large surface reservoirs and these reservoirs are fast response, uh, responsive. When uh, conditions in the indoor environment changes, it will uh, continue to emit chemicals into the air and will um, keep the concentration similar as uh, before ventilation. And we believe these uh, from the surfaces, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, these surface reservoirs that has uh, stored the chemicals. And this actually also happened to a lot more species. So showing here uh, ammonia and um, a few carboxylic acid with different carbon numbers and some neutral compounds. So these two are basic and uh, acidic species, but it also happens for neutral compounds like phenol, furfural, uh, alcohols, siloxins, um, terpenes. 
So uh, this shows that um, a lot of these chemicals are actually really stored indoors in uh, surfaces. And we continue this study in uh, uh, research recently in Shenzhen. Um, we repeat the experiment in the apartment. So as just I mentioned, mentioned two slides ago, uh, that previous study was in a house. And we want to see if that happens again in an apartment building. So in this uh, similar set of experiments, uh, we ventilated the apartment unit by opening the balcony door. So the blue color shows the living room um, concentration. Here it was a normalized signal because the data has been just collected and uh, we haven't um, finalize the uh, mixing ratio. So, but the behavior shows a similar trend. When you open the doors and windows to ventilate the house, the, the concentration drops and it builds up again. And that happens for many different types of VLCs. So confirm our idea of the large surface reservoirs indoor. And to show another example here is um, an evidence of uh, a chemical hono uh, nitrous acid. So showing here is the impact of air conditioning on um, indoor hono concentration. And then we believe this, this was for uh, because of uh, aqueous partitioning. So the, the mixing ratio of hono shows its drop increasing and decreasing, increasing and decreasing. And in this, uh, interestingly follows the similar trend as the air supply temperature and humidity. And specifically, um, the trend uh, exactly follows the um, temperature drop and uh, humidity increase. So um, on the diagram on the right, uh, we think what happens is when, we, uh, when the cooling call is on, so when the temperature is dropping, um, there is water condensing on the cooling coil. And because of these water um, on the cooling coil, these water soluble gases will partition to the reservoir. So for example, HONO and many other water soluble gases um, like ammonia and VLCs show a similar trend. And this actually has been um, pre also show seen in um, different um, studies. So to quickly sum up what I um, showed uh, here to look at the difference of indoor and outdoor VOC behavior, we saw that um, the VOCs behave differently indoors. And during this ventilation experiment, it drops and builds up again and uh, shows that VOC lingers on surfaces after even after ventilation. And another um, what we can learn from this study is that uh, this is showing the exposure path pathway can be different. So if these chemicals are on surfaces, people get exposed through thermal contact. But if they're in the air, then inhalation can be important. And um, so an another is uh, again from this um, plot, it shows that outdoor air concentration is lower. And during ventilation, these residential emissions could contribute to the outdoor atmosphere. And finally, if the chemical stays on surfaces, surface chemistry is going to be indoor, uh, going to be important indoors. And this is uh, what I'm going to talk about in the second half of the talk, uh, looking at the in the chemical processes, reactive processes in the indoor environment. So here, a uh, case study is on the multi-phase chemistry of uh, chlorine. Um, we, uh, we've used a lot of uh, disinfectants and cleaners, especially since 2020, when uh, COVID-19 started. Um, this is a diagram showing uh, reported uh, exposures of uh, disinfectant. And a lot of that exposure actually happens through uh, inhalation because the cleaners are volatile. It will emit a lot of uh, species into the air and then people get exposed to these clean, cleaning disinfectant emissions. And uh, here is a, a study uh, conducted by a previous colleague showing uh, cleaning 
using bleach leads to emissions of a lot of chlorine species. So each of these increases is a mopping event in a, a room. When you mop the floor with uh, cleaners that contain, for example, sodium hypochlorite, uh, chlorine gas, um, HOCl, and many other uh, chlorine containing species like uh, chloramines, chlorocarbons are increasing. And interestingly, um, they also observed increased chlorine con content in the particles. So um, based on the study, we wonder what is the impact of bleach cleaning on indoor chemistry. So for example, there are a lot of VOCs involved. Will these emissions, the chlorine gas, react with the VOCs to make uh, either secondary organic aerosol or secondary pollutants, secondary VOCs. And after forming these uh, products, are they going to transport outdoors and play a role in the outdoor atmosphere? So uh, in the next um, um, 10 minutes, I will just talk about um, a few um, re results from this on this topic. And first is a chamber study. So to answer this question, we actually conduct both chamber and uh, field studies. In this chamber study, we did a very simple experiment by putting a VOC lemonine into the chamber. And after lemonine um, mixed well in the chamber, reach a stable signal, we add uh, chlorine gas and HOCl into the chamber. So these are the major emissions from um, chlorine bleach cleaning. We see that uh, immediately when we add in this gas, there is a decrease of lemonine. And simultaneously, we observe formation of gas phase products. And very interestingly, when we turn on the light, so this is indoor fluorescent light, so visible light. Or when they expose the chamber to light, sunlight that passed through a window in the lab. So interestingly, we see ultrafine particle formation and then growth of the particle. What happens um, in this process, um, I think, is reaction between lemonine and uh, HOCl and Cl2 makes reaction products. And these are in the dark. When we turn on the light, there, there are production of radicals, chlorine, or OH radical. And this is um, showing in the um, plot below. So this is um, what our measurement of light irradiance distribution at different wavelengths. In the indoor environment, the light we use often are in the visible range with a small um, fraction of high wavelengths UV light. So nevertheless, there is overlap of uh, HOCl and Cl2 absorb absorbance and these indoor lights or window sunlight. And because of that, um, the dissociation of phot photolysis of HOCl and Cl2 will make chlorine atom or OH radical, leading to further reaction. So you think about these processes. This is actually going to happen when you really clean this uh, bleach cleaner. And in addition to particles, we also observed formation of gas phase products. Here, an example is a toxic compounds, compound isocyanic acid with a very simple structure, one hydrogen, one nitrogen, one carbon, one oxygen. Uh, although it's simple, it's toxic. So we see that um, when we clean the indoor environment, this is in a real indoor environment, we, uh, each time we clean, we observe an increase of um, HNCO. So we think what produces HNCO is the reaction of HOCl with um, reduced nitrogen that's absorbed on indoor surfaces. And that's through multiple processes uh, produce isocyanate. In addition to HNCO, we also saw a lot of um, chlorine containing VOC, nitrogen, and nitrogen containing VOC. So the plot on the right axis shows total nitrogen containing species and total nitrogen containing species by two different instruments. 
what I'm showing here is um, signals from nitrile, um, amines, isocyanates, amines, chloramines, and natural compounds. And as an example, on the right, um, just showing a few of these um, group of compounds, um, like um, mono di monochloramine, dichloramine, trichloramine, and uh, isocyanic acids, organic isocyanates, and nitriles such as acetyl nitrile, HCN, and mice. A lot of these species actually are uh, harmful and um, they have uh, further health effects. So we, we did uh, some other studies recently, also in a uh, kitchen and environment, cleaning with uh, bleach uh, containing cl cleaners, and here showing some uh, formation of different type of uh, VOCs. The top ones are those with uh, containing chlorine. The me middle uh, panel shows chemicals that only form when there's light. So there's increase when light is around some oxygenated VOCs and some high uh, CH containing compounds, um, which we think these are um, fragments. So we will further process this data and, um, in, in the future and having more um, comprehensive uh, interpretation. So overall, to summarize the second part of the talk, uh, we show that uh, there is a um, formation of different type of um, secondary products, either particles or VOCs. And a final question is, are they going to uh, get emitted outdoors to influence outdoor atmosphere? So we actually um, first conducted measurement to looking for chloramines in the ambient atmosphere. These data are showing summertime and wintertime measurement for all these three uh, chloramines um, with one chlorine, two chlorine, and three chlor chlorines. And uh, luckily, we see all, uh, all three of them, although their signals vary during different time of the day, they are present. And to assess their contribution to atmospheric chlorine atom production, we look at uh, photolysis of NCL3, um, compare that with traditional sources of chlorine, such as chlorine gas and ClNO2. And the top panel shows absolute contribution, the production rate. Bottom panel is the fraction of each uh, species. We see that uh, NCL3 actually dominates chlorine production, especially in the summer. And for winter time, the contribution is non negligible. So here it's showing that possibly emissions of chloramines either from indoor environment or maybe other unknown sources are really contributing to the outdoor atmosphere oxidation capacity. And um, this is all I want to present here. And I just want to acknowledge um, um, students and postdocs in my group. They're working hard to collect the data. And uh, some of the work I present today out during my postdoc um, um, at University of Toronto and collaborators from the home time um, study. And thank you all for your attention. And I would like to take any questions. OK, thanks, Chen. Uh, very nice talk and very <laughs> many interesting results. Let's see if there are any questions from the audience. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there's a question. What are the immediate signs of the sim and the sim symptoms of indoor air pollution? Um, sorry, I didn't. Uh, what I, are, are the any... signs or and the symptoms of indoor air pollution? Uh, and and their symptoms of in, uh, indoor air pollution. <laughs> Um, that's a very good question. So for outdoor air pollution, people often see, you know, um, it's um, influencing uh, visibility or having um, like um, smoking days. But for indoor environments, one of the major uh, symptoms you will see is uh, you, you could see that uh, there is sick building syndrome. Maybe when you stay in a, a classroom with 200 people, there are a lot of emissions of 
carbon dioxide and other will see you feel sleepy. That's part of the uh, symptom. So this is a simple <laughs> example yeah, okay. of a symptom of um, you know indoor air pollution. Yeah, so the ventilation is really important. Your your results yeah, show ventilation the ventilation is the top um, important thing to consider when you want to control indoor air quality. Yeah, especially after the COVID nineteen, you know, the ventilation. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, uh, actually, I, I have a question. You know, uh, I did some of the indoor measurements about the ozone uh, indoors. The concentration of the ozone indoors is much lower than outdoors because you know the government professor government mentioned the, the 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 heat waves and the ozone pollution and the professor can also mention the health impact of ozone but the, why mm -hmm. the ozone concentrated indoors is so low and how do you comment on the health impact of the indoor ozone compared with the outdoor okay uh, this is a great question um, it's exactly right that indoor when you measure indoor ozone concentration is a lot lower than outdoors um, but this is not, um, but that doesn't mean it's not important. The lower ozone concentration indoors is because ozone is reactive and there is no UV light indoors. So when you think about uh, sources of ozone, it's produced from photochemistry, but in the indoor environment, there is no UV light. So we cannot produce ozone indoors. So all the ozone inside in the indoor environment are actually from outside. And through the transportation of ozone from the outdoor environment, you will get lost because it's reactive. It gets lost through the surfaces and, you know, all the building materials. And that's why you see a low ozone concentration indoors. But in terms of the health impacts, uh, although it's low, um, I, I, I missed the talk by Professor Ken. I think he did a lot of work on uh, the health impacts of uh, indoor ozone exposure. So ozone can produce secondary pollutants indoors and that can have a uh, health effects. And even though it's low, it could also make some influence. Um, so long-term exposure of low concentration pollutants, I believe can still play a role. Um, I hope this is okay. answering your question. Okay. Uh... Okay, another another question. <clears throat> oh, we're, oh, we're almost running out of time. Okay, another question is, you know, how do you comment on the daytime and the nighttime chemistry, the indoor chemistry? Uh, okay. You know, considering this is the, the, the cleaning process or some uh, some uh, some uh, other uh, human activities. Yeah. Okay. Um, daytime and nighttime. Um, for the indoor the environment. Sorry. Oh, no, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so for indoor environments, I think um, although light is important, it's not as um, important as the outdoor environment because um, sunlight is the driver for a lot of chemical processes. And in the indoors, the uh, glass windows screen out a lot of the low wavelength um, light. So photochemistry indoor Although I talk about photolysis of uh, chlorine, it's not as important as the outdoor atmosphere. So then to compare daytime and nighttime, this is a, a good question because um, when you think about the indoor environment, a lot of the reactions in the dark ozone chemistry. Yeah. Um, because photolysis is not as important. So I, I would say there are less um, so the, the difference of daytime and nighttime chemistry indoors is um, less significant. But this, this is a good thing to consider in future studies. I, I, I don't think there is a lot of um, research on that topic yet. OK. Uh, OK, I think we have a final question. Uh, you know, you, in your last slide, you mentioned you know, the, the, to characterize the impact of the indoor pollutants uh, on the outdoors. So do you have some uh, some methods to, to to do this kind of study? Because usually with 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 we thought you know most the indoor protest was mainly influenced by the outdoors. So how how do you how do you the character such an influence? Um yes exactly uh, there there's an interesting um 
the paper, for example, uh, about uh, four five years ago, a paper published in Science showing the volatile chemical products mainly used indoors are emitting to the outdoor environment and contributing to uh, outdoor air uh, atmosphere chemistry. So I think uh, a, a simple answer to this question is uh, you have to use uh, combining measurement and modeling to assess the con contribution of the indoor emissions to outdoor uh, environment because um, there, there are a lot of processes involved. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Thanks. And uh, uh, we shall end our session now. And uh, we really appreciate the five speakers for their excellent talks. And uh, I hope all, you also enjoy this session. So I'll see you next time. Yeah, it's uh, next time.